you have your Bibles, I would invite you to take them and open them to Genesis chapter 21 as we stand together for the reading of God's holy word in Genesis 21, 1 through 21. Genesis 21, 1 to 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And when the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God said, and God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Well, this is the word of God. And you may be seated. Let's begin our time in God's word with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and this seems like a simple, straightforward story, Lord, but just like you opened the eyes of Hagar um, to see a well of water, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, Lord, to see the water of life in Jesus Christ uh, in this passage, that you would clarify the gospel for us, Lord, that you would bind the promises closely to our hearts as we work our way through this passage. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. As you look back on your life and you think about all the experiences that you've had and you try to narrow it down to what are some of the most happiest or or most joyful experiences, I wonder what you might say. Some of you maybe look back on experiences you had in your childhood with your parents and you think about the joyous times that you may have had then. Others of you, maybe you think back to your wedding day. You know, you had this relationship with your spouse that was growing and growing and growing, and you had all kinds of hopes and 
dreams and expectations and you planned for that one day. And then you had that one day and you knew that that was the beginning of your life together. Maybe that is the joyous experience that you remember. For others of you, maybe it was the day your children were born. Again, when your children are born, you have hopes and dreams and expectations for what they will grow to be and do and experiences that they may have. Maybe that's the joy Either way, joy often comes from experiences that we have when we have waited a long time for that experience to happen. And that's exactly what we see in our passage before us this morning. In fact, if you're with us, joining us, and you are new, you'll see in the bulletin right under the liturgy, the sermon ideas printed right there. And that is the main idea of our passage this morning. God is completely sovereign in when... In how he fulfills his promises, and in how he distinguishes who his people really are. This passage really has, like a coin, two sides. One side is incredibly joyful, another side is a little more full of sorrow this morning, and that, that is what we need to unpack this morning. And I want to begin with our first point in verses 1 through 7 the sovereignty of God in fulfilling his promises. Take a look again with me at verses 1 and 2. We can see very clearly the timing of God's promises in verses 1 and 2. The Lord visited Sarah and as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time in which God had spoken to him. Now the passage begins very interestingly. The Lord visited Sarah. That is an interesting phrase, isn't it? It's a phrase that we see used several times throughout the Old Testament. We see Jesus use it once in the New Testament, but it's the language of God visiting his people is used to communicate that God is about to act in a redemptive way that is consistent with his promises. That's what the idea of visitation means. We see it in the, in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 6. Many of you remember the story. There was a famine in the land and a man named Elimelech takes his wife Ruth and his sons Mahon and Kilion, and they go to the land of Moab. And there, tragically, they, all three of the men die, leaving Ruth and Oprah, um, not Oprah, Oprah, go figure, Oprah, <laughs> right? <laughs> leaving these two women widowed who were married to their sons, and then Naomi, who was their mother, was also widowed, But you go to Ruth chapter 1, verse 6, and it's really interesting. It says, the Lord visited his people and gave them food. In other words, the Lord had visited his people. He acted in a redemptive way in the context in which they fled from. They fled from Bethlehem, and that is where the Lord met and visited his people to save them. Well, here we see something very similar. God visits Sarah in our, in our passage, and he is about to bring about for her the thing that he had promised 25 years earlier. Now imagine that, 25 years of waiting, hearing the promises of God repeated over and over and over again, wondering each time when God was going to come through. And yet we see here the centrality of God's promises in verses 1 and 2, and we see it again in verse 4. The the focus here in the beginning is God's promises and His faithfulness to fulfill them on behalf of His people. I mean, the the focus of His promises is is prominent in several ways. We see in verses verses 1 and 2, notice how it repeats as he said, as he promised in verse 1. Verse 2 and verse 4 end pointing to God's word and the promises that he made to Abraham and Sarah. And so when we talk about the birth of this son, the birth of Isaac, there was great anticipation, there was great waiting, and it was all to fulfill what God had promised Now, what's interesting about that promise is it had to be supernaturally fulfilled. This was not just a normal birth, as we've seen throughout the book of Genesis up to this point. This 
really required God to step in supernaturally and move in and through Abraham and Sarah to accomplish it. That is why they had to wait so long. So we see the centrality of God's promise in his word here, but we see also the precision in his timing. Precision in God's timing. Look again at verse 2. There are three things I want to draw your attention to, but it says, And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time in which God had spoken to him. There's three things in that one verse that highlight the timing of God in the promises being fulfilled. And the first one is, maybe you glanced over it and missed it, but it's when it says, And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son. Notice those two verbs there, conceived and bore. Now that gives you a a beginning and an end to this process, which we tend to call today the period of gestation, the complete time frame of her pregnancy. Now again, notice the supernatural nature of God fulfilling this in the conception. We saw back in Genesis chapter 11, uh, verse 30, that Sarah was no ordinary woman. She was barren. In a time when it was a woman's status in society to bear children and how many she had, Sarah was previously barren. And then we know she was also beyond the age of childbearing. We've seen Abraham kind of laughing in the past when God made a promise. Will a man who's 100 years old and a, a woman who's 90 really give birth to a child? And yet God opened her womb supernaturally to give her children. By the way, he seems to do this several times throughout the scriptures. He'll do this later with Rebecca, Isaac's wife, later on. He'll do this with Rachel, Jacob's wife. He does it with Hannah in 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2. But notice, the Lord sovereignly protects Not just the circumstances of conception, but the whole time Isaac is in the womb to bring that child of promise to birth. You've got to imagine, historically speaking, this was a time when many women often died in childbirth. Children often didn't make it past, you know, being born and surviving long. And yet God is faithful and sovereign in bringing Isaac to bear. The second thing it says about the precision of God's timing is it mentions Abraham's old age. It says she bore him a child in his old age. And then verse 5 clarifies that for us in case there's any doubt or we miss something up to this point. He's 100 years old. Abraham is 100 years old. By the way, I think it's safe to say that probably the day that Abraham and, and Sarah got married, this was not the plan. This was not the expectation of how God was going to work. And yet God made them wait all of this time to have a child of their own. Now thirdly, it says that this is the time that God had told them. Did you catch that in verse 2? In his old age, at the time in which God had spoken to him, what's that a reference to? Well, if we go back to Genesis 18, verses 10 through 15, you remember after Abraham was hospitable to uh, the Lord and the two angels giving them a meal, they promised that at this time, God said, I will return to you, Abraham, and your wife Sarah will have a son. And so again, this, all of this highlights that God is not bound to the time frames that we impose upon him to work in our lives. He fulfills his promises when he intends to fulfill them, and that is part of his sovereign prerogative. But it's not just with respect to the timing of these promises coming to pass that our passage highlights. It's also the circumstances in verses 3 and 4. And by circumstances, I mean God fulfills his promise. How does Abraham respond? Look at verse 3. We see the circumstance of naming. He calls the name of the son who was born to him. And by the way, it highlights again whom Sarah bore. Not Hagar, Sarah. What does he name him? Isaac. 
Now, the reason I say that this highlights the word of God and his promises is because God commanded Abraham to name this child of promise Isaac. Do you remember the story back in Genesis chapter 17? Right after he institutes circumcision, um, he makes the promise again that Abraham, your wife Sarah, is going to have a son. Because Abraham was like, well, why can't it just be Ishmael? Let him live before you, O Lord. No. I've heard your plea for Ishmael. I I will bless him. But the promises are going to come through your son. And because Abraham had laughed when he made that prophecy, God says, you shall name his name Isaac. Now, if you don't know, and it's okay if you don't, the name Isaac simply means either he laughed Or, you could translate it, laughter. And so now God has fulfilled the promise, and Abraham does what God commands him to do. He gave him the son, so he names him laughter. But secondly, we see in verse 4 the circumstance of circumcision. Again, he circumcises Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. We saw that in Genesis 17. He receives the covenant sign of circumcision which, as we mentioned, is not just a picture of his faith, but a picture of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now Isaac receives the sign of righteousness that comes by faith. So we see that Abraham responds according to God's word in the circumstances. And the results of these promises are seen in verses 5 through 7. Now really, this is nothing short of poetic. Take a look at that again. Abraham is 100 years old. We see that when Isaac, his son, was born. Verse 6, Sarah says something really interesting. God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, Part of this result is the irony that she, you know, forms in this wordplay. And it is very poetic. It's, it's built around the Hebrew word for laughter. Now remember, Isaac's name means he laughs or laughter. So when laughter is born, the child of promise is here. She, he brings laughter to his mother. And by the way, this is clearly the laughter of joy that is given years after waiting this joy has been fulfilled and brought to completion but notice what she says everyone who hears this is interesting how the esv translates this everyone who hears will laugh over me this is where the poetry does what poetry does it creates a double entendre because i have no idea which of these two options it really means it could mean both It could legitimately mean people will laugh with me. In other words, join in my joy. This this child who means laughter, who brings laughter and joy to me, will bring joy to others and everyone who hears. Boy, that's exciting. Or it could also mean, in a negative connotation, everyone who hears of this will laugh at me in a mocking sense. You might wonder, well, why would they do that? Well, if you remember what happened with John the Baptist's mother, you remember what she said in Luke chapter 1? The Lord has dealt with me like this all these years, and now that I have a child, what are people really going to think? That was her concern. She hid herself for several months. I think it was five months, if I remember correctly. In other words... Regardless of how you look at this, we can't escape the irony of how God's promise is being fulfilled. And it was fulfilled, secondly, in an unexpected way. Again, look at what she says in verse 7. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? In other words, this this is unheard of. And by the way, the way she uses the word um, when she says everyone... Who would have said, the word said there in Hebrew is a word that's used not really in narrative like this, it's used in poetry. 
she's understanding the dramatic and, and divine irony of how God works. He works in an unexpected way to fulfill his promises, and it is nothing shy of ironic from a human perspective. Who would do that? And yet God did. God did. Why did he do it that way? For his own glory. So that you could not explain how this happened any other way except for the Lord had to have done this. That is the only way to account for what happened. A 90-year-old woman who was previously barren with a 100-year-old husband waiting 25 years giving birth. So with God's glory in mind with this birth, we have to ask ourselves the question, what significance does the birth of Isaac have for us today? Well, I think it's pretty clear. The, Isaac's birth points forward, believe it or not, to the birth of Christ, the true child of promise. And then secondly, it point, points forward to the new birth which is necessary for us if we are to inherit the kingdom of God. Well, how does it point forward to the, the birth of Christ? Well, think about it. This is where God outdoes himself in the New Testament from what he did in the Old Testament. If it's hard enough to make a woman... Um, who was 90 years old, who was previously barren to give birth, um, through natural conception with her husband, by the way, how much harder is it for God to bring uh, a virgin to get pregnant and bring a child into the world? It is impossible. It is not just theoretically or conceptually impossible. It is physically impossible for a woman who is a virgin to give birth. And yet that's exactly what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. What is God in the process of doing? He's in the process of taking what is not living, what is not, and bringing life out of it. That is exactly what the gospel is all about, isn't it? Taking what is dead and making it living. And that's exactly what we see. Only the difference with Isaac being the child of laughter who's meant to bring laughter and joy to the world, you see that even more so with Christ. Because what has he come to do? When he is born, he has come to sit on his father's David's throne. He's come to save his people from their sins, bring them forgiveness of sins and eternal life. What more joy could we possibly have set before us? (laughs) And yet he did it through the power of the cross. Think about how... You connect these dots. The birth of Isaac coming out of a place where life did not exist. And all of a sudden you have the life and vitality of a child. On a side note, I was sitting in my office this week. during, Like right after VBS, I don't remember what day it was. There were just kids running up and down the hallway, screaming and shouting and laughing. And I was in my office trying to study. (laughs) And one of the mothers, you'll forgive me, ladies, I can't remember which one of you popped your head in my office and said, Pastor Aaron, uh, is everything okay? Are these kids bothering you? No. For the love of God, <laughs> let them keep running. Why? It's life. Sometimes those hallways are quiet and they seem dead. It's nice to have life. But start connecting the dots. Isaac coming out of a place that should have just meant certain death, and yet his life is brought forth. Christ coming from the the womb of a virgin. Life comes forth. And Christ being the child of promise in the ultimate sense, what does Hebrews say? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the shame. And he went to the grave where there's no life. And what happens three days later for life to burst forth in resurrection glory? Do you realize that all of this points forward to the need that we all have of the new birth if we're going to see the kingdom of God? Every one of these components that we looked at this morning, the timing, the circumstance, the results of God bringing his promises to pass in the birth of Isaac is designed to point us to Christ and then through Christ to the need that we all have to be born again. Now you may be asking, well, how do you get that from this passage? Well, in order to understand that connection, we have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And in this case, I want to look at Romans chapter 4, verses 19 to 21. This is what the Apostle Paul says. 
He, being Abraham, did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Pause there. That's a nice thing to say to somebody. Unpause. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. In other words, death. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith and he, as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Again, it's the same idea I've been harping on the last five minutes. God brought life out of what should have been a context of death. And look, we are all spiritually born dead. Isn't that the truth? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. We were born dead in our transgressions and sin. And that's what, why Jesus tells us in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, that we must be born again. It's when we are born again, brothers and sisters, that we become, like Isaac, the children of promise. Now let me clarify one thing for you that I think a lot of modern evangelicals get backwards. Most people in in American evangelicalism, broadly speaking today, tend to assume that we first come to faith and then because of our decision to come to faith, then we are born again as a result. Maybe you have heard that. Maybe you have thought that. I know I did for a long time. But in fact, when we, when we examine the scriptures and we see what, God, what the gospel is really all about, it's actually backwards. We are born again first because God sovereignly moves in his circumstances, in his timing, to bring out the result that he's looking for, to cause us to go from life to death spiritually. And the result of that, secondly, is that we come to faith in Christ Now, okay, I'm going to give you an analogy here. It's not the perfect analogy, but it's the best I can come up with after a week of VBS, okay? (laughs) It's like a child being born. That's really creative, right? Isaac's birth. It's like a child being born. Does the child begin to breathe when it comes out of the womb? No. What does the doctor have to do? It's to kind of tap them or spank them or do something to get the child's attention so that it will start to scream and cry. Yes, the child is born and yes, the child is alive, but in order to access that life into its fullest, you've got to get the child breathing. The new birth is the birth. Faith is like the breathing. You access the life through the breathing. That's the best way I can explain it to you. Some of you here, like Isaac, were physically born to believing parents. But what this passage calls you to do or your need is to be born again. And by the way, that's true of any of us in this room who have been born again. That was our greatest need, wasn't it? And yet we we continue to trust God and look to Him to cause this to happen in our lives. Because, why is the new birth so important? It's important because of our second point this morning in verses 8 through 21. The sovereignty of God in distinguishing His people. God will distinguish who is His and who is not His by that birth. Let's unpack 8 through 21. We see in verses 8 through 10, the distinguishing that happens through persecution. This is really kind of interesting. And probably if you're a parent, Not terribly surprising what goes down. Look at verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the the day that Isaac was weaned. That's a joyful experience. Verse 9, not so joyful. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. You know, on the surface, it's hard to tell what the real problem is without some context, right? I mean, after all, a child whose name means laughter has been weaned, and so they're throwing a feast which brings laughter and joy. And in a context in which laughter and joy should be prominent, what we see is the son of Hagar, Ishmael, laughing at a three-year-old named Isaac. Isaac. 
What's the problem? Well, I'll tell you the problem. It's twofold. One, Ishmael's laughing is no laughing matter on the surface. This word is a participle, which means an ongoing verb. This means that this wasn't just limited only to this, this instance. This is the instance in which it came to a head. This was something that I, uh, Ishmael was continually doing. Some of you who know children, have many children know that you know, sometimes one child just continue to poke at the other, right? Until the other blows up. And that's kind of what's happening here. This is just a continually gnawing laughter. But this is not just laughter of having innocent fun. This is laughter that is mocking. In fact, the Hebrew verb there is in an intensive stem, which just means it strengthens the meaning of what it means to laugh. Well, what's the strengthening of laughing? Well, now you're not laughing with someone. You are laughing at somebody. You are mocking them. This is what Ishmael is doing. And you can imagine... In Sarah, her anger in verse 10 where she blows a gasket. Notice what she does here in her response. She never names Hagar and she never names Ishmael. But she mentions them twice. This slave woman and her son. (laughs) She won't even use the names. She's so angry. And what does she tell Abraham to do? Again, she uses another intensive verb in Hebrew. Drive them out. Don't just send them away. Drive them out. Abraham, you get rid of this slave woman and her son right now. Why? Well, really, what what it comes down to is this. It's all about who is going to inherit the promised covenant blessing. Who's going to inherit the promises of God. This slave woman's son will not inherit with my son Isaac. It's interesting that God is using in his sovereignty the, this persecution of Ishmael, of Isaac, to begin to draw the distinction between who his real people are going to be. And notice, those who are not are characterized, like Ishmael here, by persecution. Those who persecute. You see this distinguishing further through separation in verses 11 through 13. In verse 11, you can understand, you've got to understand Abraham's conundrum here and his separation anxiety. It says, the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. By the way, the son he's talking about is Ishmael. I'm I'm inclined to think perhaps his failure here is not addressing the ongoing problem in the first place as a father should have. But he didn't, and now his son is being sent away. And you see that in verses 12 and 13. That's what they do. What I find interesting about God's response in verse 12, I think in our American context, we're like, can't they just work it out? (laughs) Can't they just get along and... You know, everybody just be at peace and, and preserve the unity of the family. Isn't that what we really should be after as Christians? No, that's not what God does here, though. And it's kind of surprising. Because if you go back to, to Genesis chapter 16, verse 2, it uses an interesting phrase when, when Ishmael is conceived in the first place, which was Sarah's idea. Abraham listened to the voice of his wife. Now, you trace that phrase back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. You know that's a bad idea because that's exactly what what Adam did. He listened to the voice of his wife, and God rebukes him for it. Now you see the shoe is on the other foot. God says in verse 12, listen to the voice of your wife, Sarah. By the way, that should rule out any sexism in the Bible, right? I mean, come on. He rebuked him once, but now he says, okay, listen to your wife. Listen to her voice. Send him away. Why? God gives a reason. And it actually agrees with what Sarah had said. For through Isaac, your offspring shall be named. So what God is doing, he's, he's, just, prom- he's just reiterating to Abraham, repeating again, because we all need to hear these promises seemingly over and over and over again. Abraham's no different. Through Isaac, your son, the covenant blessings will come. But what about Ishmael? Well, look at verse 13. 
mean, God is not heartless. What does God say in verse 13? I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. By the way, that is, I would say, much more gracious towards Abraham than it is even to Ishmael. Because the reason is not because of who Ishmael was. It's not because Ishmael was being unfairly treated that God is making that concession. It is on account of Abraham. And so you see that distinguishing come through common grace in verses 14 through 21. You see three things here, and on the surface they're going to sound kind of good, but they really are kind of tragic when you think about it in the wide scope of things. First, in verses 14 through 17, we see the revelation of common grace. Um, I won't go through all the details. Abraham sends them out. If you look at that one detail, though, of he puts a skin of water and a piece of bread, gives them, that's not a lot of sustenance to give people and send them out into the wilderness. But he does. He wakes up early in the morning and sends them out. Of course, it really doesn't take long for them to exhaust that sustenance of water and bread and she puts the boy under a bush and doesn't want to see him die and they're on the brink of death in verse 17 look at verse 17 and god heard the voice of the boy and the angel of god called to hagar from heaven and said to her what troubles you hagar fear not for god heard the voice of the boy where he is Again, you have to love the way that God deals with people sometimes and how perfect it is. I mean, Isaac's name means laughter. If you remember from Genesis chapter 16, um, verse 11, Ishmael's name means he has heard. In other words, God has heard. And it's interesting that God told Hagar to name this boy Ishmael because the Lord listened to her affliction when she was pregnant with him. Now he lives up to his name because God has heard his voice. What an example of common grace. God hears the voice of a boy for the sake of Abraham, who's not really part of the covenant, but God is gracious anyway. And it leads to the salvation that is, I would call this salvation, common grace. This isn't like eternal life. This isn't really tied to the covenant promises themselves. But God acts in a common grace, gracious way. He saves their lives. He opens Hagar's eyes in verses 18 and 19 to see the well so she can give the boy a drink so he will survive. And then on top of that, he tells Hagar what he's already told Abraham on two different occasions. He tells her that he's going to take her son and he's going to make him a great nation. Which, by the way, he does when you fast forward to Genesis 25. You can imagine when she's at the end of herself, this would have given her a sense of purpose, a sense of that God has a plan for them, that while they've been thrown away by everybody else, God hasn't quite thrown them away. There's still a common grace plan for them. And then you see the presence of common grace. This is really interesting to me in verse 20. God was with the boy and he grew up. That may seem like such a, I'm just reading through this kind of statement, easy to miss. But notice that you have a boy that is not really in the covenant and yet God is still present with him on account of Abraham, his father. Now, I said that it's, Sounds really good on the surface, but when you take a wide-angle look, it sounds really bad. Why do I say that? Well, I want you to think about this. One commentator writes this. Um, Hagar and Ishmael's experience actually anticipates what's going to happen with Israel 400 years later coming out of Egypt. They're going towards Egypt, and it, it kind of mirrors it in reverse. Their experience is Exodus without liberation. Revelation without salvation. In other words, eternal salvation. Wilderness without covenant. Wandering without land. Promise without fulfillment. Unmerited exile without return. That's a hard deal. 
But I want you, to, I, I repeat that from that commentary, which was very perceptive, to really draw in your minds the distinction that is being made here. Every one of those things that's without, 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 are the things that Isaac and his descendants will receive. It doesn't mean that God is completely ungracious to those in the world who are not in saving relationship with them. We can all look around us and see. There are people who are not believers who have it really good in this world. Common grace. So what significance does sending Ishmael away have for us today? Well, sending him away shows Christians that God can and does use persecution to clarify who is and who is not truly an heir of his promises. Okay, where do I get that from? Well, in the New Testament book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to churches that are dealing with, uh, they've heard the gospel, They've received it with joy, but now they're starting to to kind of backslide and trust in their own good works, the works of the law, in order to save them. And what's more is there are people in the church pushing that kind of movement to rely on good works in order to be saved. And it is those people that are persecuting the true believers that are holding to the true gospel. And Paul, if you ever read, if you read through Galatians, it's six chapters. You can probably get it done in a half an hour. You will sense that Paul is kind of at his wit's end with these people. He's frustrated. He's upset that all the work and toil of the gospel that he's done seems like on the surface like it's coming to nothing. But you get to chapter 4, verses 21 21 to 31, which we read earlier. Paul points back to our passage to show that God uses persecution to show who are really his and who are not his. Think about it. He spends verses 21 to 26 arguing that the true children of Abraham are born according to the promise. That's our first point, right? This morning, they're born again. But then in verses 28 to 31, it brings us to The second point here that he's drawing out for us in Genesis 21, he says, Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. In other words, you've been born again. But just as as at that time, in other words, Genesis 21, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also is it now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to be very brief with my application here for the sake of time, because you can go on and on with this. But the point is, brothers and sisters, let's not be surprised when the world persecutes us. And let me, let me tell you something that might surprise you, but I'm telling you not to be surprised by it. Don't be surprised when people who profess the name of Christ will turn around and persecute you for standing on the truth of God's word and on the gospel. I see this all the time on social media. You know, you have people who take a stand for the gospel, and then you start reading a ton, of, a ton of the comments in the thread, and you'll see people who claim to be Christians trashing whoever's taking a stand. Paul warns about those. He talks about those in Galatians as false brothers in Galatians chapter 2. They're, they're living up to the, the heritage of Ishmael that they've inherited in the flesh, and they're proving that they're not truly born again. What really saddens me to say is there are big name pastors and preachers within American evangelicalism who have published books that many of us have read that have done exactly that. They can look at the world in in, in a... um, They're trying to come across as being missional and winsome. And we do, want, we, do want to be, we do want to care about evangelism and mission. We do want to be winsome. But that is not the chief virtue. And it, with, with that in mind, what they will do is they'll tell Christians, well, you need to look at it this way. You need to approach it this way. You need to be more meek and humble and not take a stand. Really? You're going to make Christians feel guilty because they don't live up to the world's standard of things? 
and call them to repent based on the world's standards rather than calling the world to repent on biblical standards, that's a wolf. That's a wolf. And we see it. So brothers and sisters, let's not be surprised, but this is a call to faith, to cling to the promises of God. Because what does Paul say, and I'll say this in closing, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ to the glory of God. Isn't that why Isaac was born to the glory of God? So that the promises would be yes and amen? It brings us right back to our initial point, doesn't it? Right from the beginning, God is completely sovereign in when and how he fulfills his promises and how he distinguishes who are really his people. Brothers and sisters, let's cling to Christ and let's prove ourselves in the long run to be those who are born again, who walk with Christ and will inherit the promises of eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning and we are thankful for the precious, precious promises that you give us in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins, the promise of new birth, new life, new purpose, and the gift of faith. We thank you for these things and we just pray, O Lord, that you would take your word, write it on our hearts, strengthen us this week that we may walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that you've given us as children of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, if you looked at your bulletin, you would see that it says...